Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And today, as we meet together, again through the video contacts that we have here, we want to worship and honor our God Almighty. We want Him to get the praise and the glory that He deserves to have because this is the most special day. This represents the most significant event in all history, the day that Jesus Christ came back from the dead. We mentioned on the Good Friday message that the first half of the greatest event in history was his death. And today we celebrate the second half, the significant part that demonstrates that God approved of what he did and that he arose from the dead because he is the victorious savior that we that we worship. So as we welcome you today, I want to uh, just say thank you for watching. I trust that this can be an enjoyable time as we share together from the wondrous story of the resurrection. We're going to be looking at Luke 24, Luke 24, and we're going to study this passage today as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So bow with me for a few moments as I pray and ask God's blessing upon our time together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege that we have, again, of worship. Thank you that we can worship in a unique way as we watch uh, videos on the internet, as we listen to video songs on the internet, as we praise you and honor you as families together. Thank you for that. Thanks that we can be with loved ones. I pray that we can be with one another in a, in, in, as soon as possible. We recognize, Father, that during this time right now that we are isolated and we're separated, but yet we can be together in spirit. Because we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we can make contact with one another. Help us do that, Father. Help us enjoy the technology that we have by making good touch with each other, by encouraging, by reaching out with phone calls, with emails, with texts, with Facebook, with other means, Father. Help us in all of that. But now I want to pause and simply ask, bless this time as we share the truth of the resurrection story. Help us to see from this passage of Scripture and from the truths that we bring out from it, Father, that we have hope, and we have hope that springs eternal because we have our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again on our behalf. Bless each person as they watch. I pray that you would help as we uh, consider these, these ideas Help us to get the understanding that we need, Father. Understanding from your Holy Spirit, from your Word. Help me be clear in what I say, and again, thank you. I pray your blessing over this time. I, ask your, I thank you that your presence is with us, and I pray this in Jesus' wondrous name, the risen Savior. I pray it in his name. Amen. I had a friend once that um, used to make a statement so often, and, and, and he'd say it with, with somewhat of a... A joke behind it but he would oftentimes say don't confuse me with the facts because I've already made up my mind and he would oftentimes say this because he knew people that didn't want to hear what was real he knew people that didn't want to embrace the truth he knew people that had made up their minds and there was nothing that were that was going to change uh, their, their, their focus and their mindset and this morning as we celebrate the resur resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ I want us to realize that to some extent, that's what the disciples said when they heard first that Jesus had risen from the dead. Some of the men said to the women that came to tell them, that's nonsense, that can't happen. In other words, they were saying to these ladies, don't confuse me with the facts because I've already made up my mind. And I wonder how many of us have made up our mind with regard to the hope that we ought to have day by day as we focus on our future. Right now we're living in difficult times with the isolation, with the coronavirus and all that that's happening around us. And I, I'm sure that there are ways in which disappointment sets in. Some of us are disappointed because we can't do the things we want to do. We can't see people we want to see. And, and there's reason to be disappointed in that, sure. But when we let disappointment to dictate our lives, that's, that's not comfortable. That's not helpful. 
Or maybe discouragement is the key. We are discouraged and we just don't know when is it going to change? How is it going to change? What happens when the, when the, the economy and when, when work starts up again? What happens when these things start going? Will we be safe? And we can be discouraged over some of the reports we get. We listen to news. And, and I just encourage, don't listen to too much news these days because th that can be so discouraging. It can be so difficult to hear some of the things that are said. Some of the bickering between the political parties. Some of the expression of, of why, why didn't this happen or why shouldn't this happen or whatever else. And discouragement can be the result. And we don't want discouragement to set in. And despair. Despair oftentimes follows discouragement. And people throw up their arms and they say, oh, what good is it? Why, why do we, we even care? And, and I think that's, that's challenging. And, and, and we this morning, we're going to find hope in what Jesus Christ accomplished for us at Calvary. We find hope because our sin is forgiven. We're also going to find hope because we know that God controls the future. God's in charge, and he's got us in the palm of his hand. And therefore, we have to realize that discouragement, disappointment, despair, these are things that can sometimes set us off on a path where we shouldn't be going. But yet, we need to always look and see, what does God have in store for us? When our expectations aren't met, where do we turn? We should turn to God's Word. When excitement becomes limited or sometimes even lost, we might find truth in God's Word that gives us that sense of, of excitement, that sense of knowing God's in charge. We might find encouragement to be missing at times, or morale may be low, yet we can turn to God's Word. We can turn to the fact that He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And we can find that God gives us that blessing that we need. Now, sometimes the, hope, the search for hope can become desperate. Sometimes our desire for hope can be so strong that we begin believing things we ought not believe. So this morning, I want us to turn to Luke chapter 24. Turn to that passage in, 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 your, in your Bibles. I'm going to read it in a few minutes, but let me set the context here. Let me explain what's going on as we look at this particular passage. Because what we see prior to what we're going to read here in a few moments is that Jesus was betrayed. Betrayed by Judas. He was arrested. He was tried with a very unjust trial. And he was sentenced to death. We know that story well. We recognize that and the scriptures talk about these things. He was crucified. Then he was buried in a borrowed tomb a tomb that was secure and sealed because the Romans saw to it that it, was, that it was sealed. And they had guards outside it. And Jesus Christ was buried in that tomb. We know those, those, those realities, those facts. But yet we find that on the third day, the day we celebrate today, that women found the tomb empty. Some of his friends, some of those that had followed him, they went out to the tomb and they found it empty. They were going to seek to anoint his body with special oils, but yet his body wasn't there. And his closest friends, as they saw all of this, as they heard all of this, some of them became frustrated. Some of them became fearful. They were hiding. Some of their thoughts became fuzzy because they weren't thinking straight, considering the things that Jesus had promised to them would happen. So we turn to Luke 24, and I begin reading with verse 13. It says, Now that very day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to one another about all the things that had happened. They were talking, while they were talking and debating these things, Jesus himself approached and began to accompany them, began to walk alongside of them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Then he said to them, What are these ideas that you are exchanging with one another so intently as you walk along? They stood still, looking at him very sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him and said, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here in these last few days? He said to them, What things? What are you talking about? 
And they said to him, The things concerning Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping and expecting that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel and rescue us from Rome. Not only this, but now it is the third day since these things happened. But also, some women among us amazed us today when they were at the tomb early this morning and when they did not find his body they came back and said that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive then some of those who were with us went to the tomb and they found exactly as the women had said but they did not see him so then Jesus said to them you foolish people slow of heart not wanting to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the rest of the prophets, he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. So as they approached the village where they were going, he acted as if he wanted to go farther. But they urged him, Stay with us, because it is getting toward evening, and the day is almost done. So he went in to stay with them. When he had taken his place at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. He broke it and gave it to them. And at this point, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Suddenly he vanished out of their sight. They said to one another, didn't our hearts burn within us while he was speaking with us on the road, while he was actually explaining the scriptures to us? So immediately they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, even though it was late. And they said to those, ooh, I'm skipping, I'm sorry. They got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together. And they were saying to them, The Lord has really risen from the dead, and has appeared also to Simon. And then they told what had happened along the road, and how they recognized him when, in their house, he broke bread with them. That's the passage from Luke chapter 24. And as we look and see some things that we can gain from this, let's stop and consider just how this, this passage uh, speaks to us and, and what it's actually saying to us today. Because the first thing I want us to realize is that, that there were two travelers here, these two men. Two travelers along the road, and they were going to Emmaus, but really they were on the road to, Why, God, why did this happen? You see, they were having this very intense and animated discussion with one another. The passage explains that their, their words, that they were expressing these things, that they were discussing in a very intense and argumentative fashion. And they were animated in their discussion. In the spirit of debate, as they were going back and forth and back and forth, and Jesus saw this, he heard this. He knew what they were saying, probably, but yet... Uh, as he comes up to them and, and, and he, he sees them, he, he begins to approach them. And he approached these two travelers that were on the road to, Why God? And he was a traveler who was actually in their mind, Well, where in the world have you been? Don't you know what's going on? Because when Jesus joined them, you see, they were unable to recognize him. It says their eyes were prevented from knowing who he was. And he inquired of them about their serious conversation. He asked them, why are you exchanging these words? Why are you saying these things? What are you talking about? And they questioned him, thinking, this man, where, are you, where have you been? Don't you know what's going on? Don't you know what's happened? Aren't you aware of all of this? 
And they're puzzled by this visitor to Jerusalem who obviously wasn't in touch with what was going on, at least in their eyes, in their minds. You see, their thinking was so distracted by the emotions that they were experiencing that they weren't remembering any of the things that Jesus had taught them. They weren't realizing that Jesus had told them that this was going to happen. And they were distraught. They were discouraged. They were distressed. And they saw this man that was walking alongside of them as being completely out of touch. So Jesus, he asked them, you know, what are you talking about? What are you saying? And it's interesting because... Uh, he prompted them to explain things that they really didn't know because they were talking about things that they'd, for, they'd forgotten what Jesus had said and they were talking about things that, that really weren't, weren't rea reality. And, and in a sense, they tried to tell Jesus about Jesus. And they had some things mistaken. They had some misunderstanding in what they said. They expressed, this was true. That he was a prophet, mighty in deed and word. That was true. That was accurate. They realized he'd been arrested and crucified. That was accurate. But then they began speaking and say, you know, we were hoping, we were hoping that this Jesus, that he would deliver us from Rome. He would rescue us from the Roman oppression of that government being in charge of the Israelite nation. But you know what? As we look back on this, we can't think anything else, but we think he failed. They didn't think that Jesus had accomplished what he was supposed to do. You see, they were deceived by their emotions. They were deceived by seeing things from their emotional perspective at that time. They were distraught. They were discouraged. They were depressed. And it said that they turned to him with a very sad look on their faces, and, and they, they, they talked to him. And they even expressed then that there are these reports that he's arisen from the dead. But in their expression back to Jesus in light of that, in the reports that he was risen from the dead, they, in a sense, said, you know, we have a hard time believing that this could be, ever be true. See, we have dashed expectations. We have disappointment and discouragement in our, in our minds. We have deception and misunderstanding about why Jesus had actually come and exactly what he came to accomplish. And in this time, they were having doubts about Jesus' claims and Jesus' character. You see, when our emotions get the best of us, when we let feelings pull us down a pathway where we're not recognizing what are the facts, what are the truths that have been expressed to us, when we're failing to see things from what God's Word teaches, we can go down a path that asks, why God? We can go down a path that sees things from a perspective that may not be exactly right. And this morning as we celebrate the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can pause for a little bit and just ask ourselves, are there things today that, that might be discouraging us? Are there things that are robbing us of hope? Are there things that are robbing us of that sense of faith that we can have, that God has this all under control? I think it's important that we, we, we see that, and as we look at the passage, we see what's the next thing that happened. You see, they got to the home where they, where they were going. Jesus appeared like he was going to keep on going farther, but it was late in the day. It was becoming night. And they encouraged him, come on in with us. Come and visit with us some more. And Jesus went into their home, and in essence, he opened the scriptures to them. Now, he'd been telling them along the way. But yet, as we see what Jesus said to them, it says that he expressed to them, Oh, you men of foolish focus. Your foolishness, your failure to believe, that's, that's unfortunate. And, and he expresses to them, wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into, into his glory? Wasn't that necessary for, for Christ to do that? 
And then he began explaining to them, in fact, I got ahead of myself a little bit ago. They weren't yet at the village when this is going on. I'm sorry, I, I expressed that in, 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 in an out of sequence fashion, so I, I, I need to go back and, and recognize that he's still along the road with them. They haven't gotten into the house yet. And, uh, you know, he, he's, he's opening their eyes by expressing the scriptures to them. He points to the foundation of our faith. And he expressed to them first in a rebuke. Isn't it foolish for you to ignore what the, what the scriptures have taught you? Isn't it foolish to ignore what the prophets have said? Your failure to believe, that's a failure to believe God's word. And he stopped and he began at the very beginning. It says he began with Moses and he explained to them all the truths, all the promises that God had made to them. Now, I don't know exactly what they were thinking at this point, but it says they invited him into their home. And, and I think that's possibly because maybe there were areas where they were starting to understand that this man had something to say. Because they arrived in Emmaus and they urged him to come and stay with them. And when they got into the house, then Jesus, in a certain sense, became their host. It was their home, but Jesus took charge. And when they brought out the bread, it says he blessed the bread and he broke it. And immediately when they brought out the bread, he'd already explained along the road the scriptures to them. He'd explained, explained the foundation of faith. When he broke the bread for them, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And the scriptures say that suddenly he vanished from their sight. And they realized that the scriptures were, in a sense, the seed for their faith. That they needed to find the seed that would help their faith to grow and recognize what the scriptures had to say to them. And, and they expressed, they say, didn't our hearts burn within us? Our hearts burned within us while he was speaking to us along the road and he was explaining the scriptures to us. And so often I think we turn to so many things to find hope. We, find, we turn to so many things to find answers to what we want. And yes, there may be answers that can be helpful in other areas, but yet we need to recognize the foundation of our faith is always in God's word. It's always right here in what God has given to us. And when the scriptures were opened up to these men, their eyes were opened as Jesus broke the bread, and then he left them. But suddenly they realized, we've got a responsibility. And immediately they decided, we need to go and offer the hope that we have to the other disciples because now we've seen that Jesus truly has risen from the grave. And although it was late and it was a seven mile trip back to Jerusalem, they determined we need to go back. And it says they traveled back, they found the eleven, and they shared with them the good news. The Lord Jesus has really risen from the dead. And they began to relate to the disciples and the others that were there, the experiences they'd had with Jesus along the road to Emmaus. And they realized that Jesus was alive. And as they gave this to the disciples, the disciples, yes, their, their thoughts were still a little bit fuzzy in various ways. It says it took time for all of them to, to process these things, but yet they were finding hope in the truth of what Jesus had revealed. And as we close off this message today, I have, first of all, three applications for us to consider. Three applications, three truths that I think we need to, to take as, as something for us this morning as we stop and consider just where are we on that road to why God? Why am I sometimes discouraged? Why am I sometimes deceived? Why are things that get me off track? Because, you know, we need to learn to be careful and cautious whenever our feelings or emotions become the main influence or the impact of what we believe. We need to go back to the, the truths of God's Word. We need to go back to the facts that God gives us. 
and be cautious to not let feelings or emotions to drive us as we navigate through life, as we live along life's journey. There are so many times where we can believe things, where we can get things out of, of sequence, we can get things out of touch because our, our, our emotions or our feelings or various rumors or different things that are being expressed can get us down. And yes, maybe there are times when it's a reality of what life is bringing us that we sometimes just get discouraged. But, you know, when our emotions begin to drive us toward why God, it's important that maybe we get back to God's Word. So that leads us to our second application. And that is that the truths and the teaching of Scripture, they provide for us a firm foundation for our faith. And I think it's important that we learn, even when I'm speaking, when I'm teaching, Go back to the scriptures and check it out. See that the scriptures, that they verify the things that are being taught. There can be others that teach us. We have all kinds of access to different truths and different ideas, or different teachings and different ideas. We can look on the internet. We can see different things that, that people have taught. And it's good for us to know that, that there is good information out there. But it's also important for us to make sure that the truths and the teaching that we're being uh, given, that they are, they are proven by God's Word, that they're verified by, by Scriptures. Because it's the teaching and the truth of what God tells us in His most precious Word that is the firm foundation for our faith. And there are so many people, there are people today, I mentioned in the Good Friday message about Charles Templeton, he recognized that he was believing something that he'd been taught to believe and he wasn't certain of it, so he became an agnostic. We hear of other people, we hear of, of music, music, musicians, Christian musicians, that they suddenly, they decide, I don't know that I can believe this anymore. And there's a failure in their faith because they're not recognizing the truths of God's Word in a, in a, in a relevant fashion. And I think it's important we, we, we can hear of people way too often that they, they become desperate. They live in a life of despair and, and depression. And soon they, they, they fail to see what God's Word is teaching. I know of different people. In fact, there's a young man right now that, that is, is close to our family. And I'm praying for him because he's lost sight of God. He's lost sight of God's Word. And, and as he... Uh, deals with life, he's not doing a good job of it right now. And I pray that, that he might find the firm foundation in, in Scripture. And then the last application. Until we recognize and really acknowledge Jesus Christ for who he is and what he has accomplished for us, let's realize that we are utterly lost and without hope. Now I have confidence that most everyone watching this video today that you have a firm understanding of who Jesus Christ is and what he's accomplished for you. But let's realize there are many people around us that they don't understand exactly who Jesus Christ is and why he came. I, I have a man that, that I've given the gospel to on a number of occasions that lives here in Appleton. And he, he's mentioned to me that, that Jesus is really the sticking point for him about faith in Christ. Jesus Christ. How can a man be born of a virgin? How can he die and come back from the, from the dead? And he can't seem to grasp how that happened. And let's realize that until anyone acknowledges Christ for who he is, he's the Lord, he's the Savior, he's the risen Lord, he's the risen Savior, that they're without hope. And they're ultimately lost. The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is the most significant event in all of history. This is our primary source of, of authentic, of real hope. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, If Christ didn't arise from the dead, everything is vain. There is no reason for hope. But yet we have hope because we know that Jesus Christ, He is risen. He is risen indeed. We know that truth. But I'd like to close with just some thoughts about really what is hope and how does it work in our lives. 
How do we gain hope? How do we, we, we include hope into our lives? Well, I'm going to spell out hope in a descriptive way that, that brings understanding to what's involved in, in, in hope. Because hope first involves honesty. It involves honesty. That's the H in hope. It's never a matter of wishful thinking. It's not something that we say, okay, I want that, I wish that. Hope is something that is based on the truth of God's Word. It, it requires honesty. It's never based on rumors or speculation. It's, again, it's based on honesty. So that's the H in hope. But secondly, it requires an openness to what God's Word tells us, an openness to God's Word. Our, our eyes have to be open to the Scriptures. We need an openness to the truth of God's Word. There may be things in there that we don't understand. There may be things in there that we can't grasp. We need to ask God, give me an open eye to understand this, dear God. I need to be open to your word. I need to understand the truths of your word. And, and we find that, that that O in hope is openness to God's word. We're always open to what the scriptures teach us. That's the foundation of our faith. So we're open to God's word. Thirdly, God's word is filled with promises. Promises. And we need to grab onto the promises of God's Word. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God promised in the, in the Old Testament by the prophets, I will send the Messiah. I will send the Savior. He's promised that He has control of this world. He's promised that He will be there when we face temptation. We need to call on Him. He's promised that He will give us relief from the anxieties that we have if we cast our cares to Him and realize that He cares for us. See, God's promises are an essential part of hope. So therefore we find the honesty, it's not speculation, it's not rumor, it's not wishful thinking. We find the openness that we have to have towards God's Word. We find the promises of God in His Word. And finally, the E, it's encouraging. It's encouraging. We can be consistently encouraged because God is forever faithful. We can be consistently encouraged because God's word is true and we find it to be true. We can be encouraged because we have friends and, and family members in Christ who give us words of encouragement, who remind us of the hope that we have in God's word, the promises of God's word. We can be encouraged because hope is such a vital thing that, that we need to have. And we can have it because of what hope involves. That honesty, that openness, the promises from God, and the encouragement because God is faithful forever. And we see that Christ arose from the dead. He died in our place and arose from the dead. And therefore, we have hope in Jesus Christ. We have hope in the truth of God's word. We have hope in the fact that Jesus Christ is alive today and seated at the right hand of God the Father. He ascended to heaven. And as faithful followers of Christ, let's realize we have a responsibility like the men that, that walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. They didn't stop and, and, and think, okay, we know Jesus is alive and we're just going to keep it to ourselves. They went and shared that hope with the other disciples. And as faithful followers of Christ, God wants us to share his message of hope with everyone around us. We can share that message of hope with those that we, already, we know already understand who Christ is, but we can express he is risen. He is risen indeed. We can share joy. We can share encouragement. We can share the truth together and be joyful. But yet we can also share that with people that need to hear the wondrous message, the wondrous message of hope that we have because Jesus Christ died on the cross in my place, in your place. He died on the cross and he arose from the dead. And we share that message with everyone that we possibly can tell. This is a season of struggle for us right now in this world. We're struggling because of the virus. We're struggling because we can't be with one another. But yet, we have opportunities. We have technology. We have ways to share the good news through email, through text, through phone calls, through video chats, and we can share. We can share on Facebook. 
we can tell others the great news that Jesus Christ, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you that it is our privilege to come into your throne room and to praise you because Jesus Christ is our risen Savior. I pray that you would help us to celebrate Jesus Christ today with, with those in our homes. Help us to enjoy time together rejoicing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Help us to be able to talk with others, maybe by telephone or by video call or by chat in, in, on the internet in various ways. And I pray that we can encourage each other with the wondrous hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I pray that you might help us to be able to enjoy all the blessings we have in Christ. I pray that you'd protect us, continue to protect us from the virus, protect us from difficulties and challenges that are unnecessary in our lives. Help us to live the lives of faith that you want us to live. Help us to reach out to friends and family members, to other church members. Help us to be all we can be as we are sources of encouragement for one another. I praise you, Father, for our family of, family of faith here at, at ACEFC. I pray that you help us to be able to overcome this particular struggle right now as soon as possible. I, I pray, Father, I pray the greatness of your good power and might that you would stop this virus in its tracks. I ask you for that. I know that it's possible. I can't say that, that, that I can demand you to do that, Father, but I can ask you to do that, and I pray that you would. I pray that you bless the families today of our church. Help us this week ahead. And again, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you that he is our risen Lord and Savior. So I pray this all in his wondrous name. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thanks for listening today. Watch our emails. Watch the different... Uh, messages we send out. We, we encourage you to stop and, and consider maybe making a video, a family video, to, to send to Frank for Zaruba so he can put it out for us next Sunday or possibly put it on the website through Katie Kempen and, and her work too. I just ask you to consider maybe doing that. Wouldn't it be great to be able to watch all kinds of uh, short videos of family members sharing, our church family members sharing a hello and a greeting to one another. But at any rate, thanks for watching. Lord bless, and we'll uh, be in touch this week. Thank you.